Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. We created this podcast to share the wonderful people we get to interact with, we get to meet, we get to know, and most importantly, get to learn from. So I invite you to join us on this journey here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Hi, we're here today with a, a, an interesting fellow who's got an interesting story that fits so much into what we're trying to do. And he's an expert on fear. And who better to have on during the month of October when we culminate the month or at Pinnacles with Halloween? And it's all about scary times. But I suspect, Scott Simon, that you're here to tell us that fear shouldn't be scary and it's something we should embrace. But I'd love to hear a little bit about you is before we get into where you become an expert in, in, in an interesting subject that I think that would be of great interest to our community here. So, Scott, you're, uh, who are you? Where are you from originally? Jim, it's great to be with you. I grew up here in the suburbs of Cleveland, probably the shortest, shyest kid in my grade. I was as far from a courage expert as one could ever imagine. And so I come at this with an everyman perspective. I'm somebody who felt fear almost all of my early life. And um, being bullied by two boys on my block, uh, changed my life dramatically. I, to keep safe, basically kept a very, very quiet and almost invisible life for most of my childhood. So I know the other side. I know how it feels to live life in a small box, and I know how defeating that can feel. I, I saw you went to a pretty darn good college. How'd that happen? Well, actually, it was. it's a bit of a shock that I went to college at all. Um, I actually had to switch high schools in the middle of high school because I had no friends. Um, I was struggling so deeply in terms of my own self-worth that my parents took me out of our public high school, sent me to a private school, started at Tulane University as a freshman and could not really handle that. It was just too much for me and ended up transferring to Skidmore College, which you're absolutely right, is a great school in upstate New York. But still, it was a struggle for me. Uh, My feelings of self-worth were so low. And um, I was so nervous about even speaking in front of one or two people, much less an entire class full of people, that it became a struggle even to get through college. After five years, I, I finally did. But I was still in that zone of life where everything just felt so overwhelming. I think, Scott, there are a lot of people in our community, in our audience, that can identify, at least at some part of their life, what you went through for most of your youth. What was the the point that just turned things for you and caused you to start to think and behave differently? Because that pattern was one of dissent for a long time. It was for a very long time. And anybody who's been bullied before and, and leads that life knows that there's so much shame involved. And you you keep this to yourself oftentimes. I was 21 and working in a record store in Cleveland. And I honestly thought, Jim, that that was probably going to be the rest of my life. I I was working the alternative music aisle and felt that I had achieved just about all that I could achieve in life. How did you get the job in that music store? Because working in retail, customer interacting, I wouldn't think that's where you would have migrated to. I was probably in the least uh, uh, attractive aisle of the record store. Um, I I think after going to college, I felt confident enough to work in a retail environment. And I'll tell you why. I I felt comfortable because I knew what I was doing in this very small little aisle. I knew all of the artists. Uh, When somebody walked down the aisle, I felt somewhat comfortable having an interaction. it gave me, I guess, a little taste of what it felt like to connect with other people in a way that I had never done before. You found a little comfort zone. There was a little one. You're absolutely right. And sometimes that's all we need to be able to say yes to something larger. But I remember being at that store, coming home after work, and I got a call that literally changed my entire life. There was a volunteer opportunity available in a low income neighborhood of Tel Aviv, where somebody was needed to teach English to Holocaust survivors for a year. Unpaid. I had never spoken the language before. I had never been to Israel before. I had never taught before. Had you ever been out of the country? 
I had been out of the country before, but I had never been to, uh, 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 I'd never been to Israel before. And everything about this opportunity just was screaming, say no. And I, I know you've probably had that experience in your life. Uh, others, all of your listeners have, where everything feels stacked against you. Like there's no way that you can say yes. And for some reason, I said yes. Tell us about your parents. I come from the most wonderful, affirming family. Um, my parents met uh, on the first day of class in Michigan State in the college bookstore. Um, I have a brother and a sister, and that was my support structure growing up. And like so many parents, they felt your pain. So it wasn't just your feeling, your shyness, your, your trying to hide to not be bullied. It was theirs too. 100%. And as a parent now myself, I, I understand that angst when our kids are going through um, challenging times. You feel helpless. You do feel helpless. I will tell you, however, and I believe this in my bones. Someone asked me at a, at a talk I was giving, I speak to companies and organizations and groups. And somebody asked me, if you could do it all over again and eradicate those bullies from your life, would you, have, would you do it now? And my answer is absolutely not. The reason that I feel empathy towards others, the reason that I feel so passionate about being able to have our voice in this world and to step into moments of uncertainty is because I overcame so much when I was young. And I don't think I would have that same fire, that same passion, if I had cruised through my early life. Some people, Scott, are listening to you and saying he overcame so much, but bullying, you know, it's not that big a deal. But in your mind, it was enormous. I think we all have our own journey and I would never compare mine to somebody else. I can only speak to how I felt in my childhood. Um, now that I speak to people about courage, I meet people from all walks of life who have gone through tremendous trauma and hardship. Um, I also have, have talked to people who have led lives that have some ease to it. But I really do believe this. We all have an option every day to act courageously. We're given choices every single day, whether we are CEOs and founders of some of the greatest companies in the world, or we're a teenager grappling with uh, the life of uh, a young person in school today. We all have the opportunity to step into a braver life. And so I, I use my own journey as my own rocket fuel. Um, and my goal is to help other people step into theirs. And so what was that step? You're in the, you're in the uh, record store, you're working in a quiet aisle, you found your quiet refuge kind of place, even though you do interact with public, but you had some degree of knowledge around the subject area, so you were capable. And then you get this call and you said yes, which is so much what we wouldn't anticipate. And, and I'd love for you to touch, if you would, Scott, on the association and connection uh, between fear and shame. Those are two of the heaviest emotions we carry, and shame can be paralyzing too. You're 100% right. I think that fear and shame are part of our psychology. There's something that we grapple with, each one of us. Um, I found that taking action in my own life was what resolved some of those issues for me, both fear and shame. I did say yes to that request, and I got on a plane to go overseas for this year of teaching by myself with, with one backpack and a Mead spiral notebook and a pen. I don't know if you've ever had a panic attack in your life, but I had a panic attack uh, as the plane took off and we were in the air leaving JFK and headed to Tel Aviv. Now you've flown before, so it's not just a flying thing. You were comfortable mm -hmm. with flying. 100% comfortable with flying. What I wasn't comfortable with was what I was about to do, flying into the unknown, in, in, literally and, and metaphorically. When you told your parents, I got this offer and I'm going to take it, were they flabbergasted? Shocked. Shocked. I, I think everybody in my family was shocked. Um, and I think that they all thought, if they were on our podcast today, they all thought I'd probably be home within a couple weeks. 
that's that was probably their expectation. And to be honest with you, there was a part of me that that was my own expectation. But I had this moment of severe panic. I was trying to conceptualize what it might be like to land and get on a flight and come back home. Um, we've all experienced those emotions where we say yes to something. And then all of a sudden there is this crazy fear that we have that we just said yes to something that we can't do. And in that panic and stress and sweat and heart racing, I pulled out that spiral notebook and I wrote eight words onto the first page of that spiral notebook. And those eight words completely changed the rest of my life. I, I wrote out, do one thing every day that scares you. And I don't know where it came from, I know, of course, I, I've written a book now about courage, and I, I have researched that 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 concept well. There it is. <laughs> it, it's it's called "Scare Your Soul" by Scott Simon. Seven powerful principles to harness fear and lead your most courageous life. Now, this comes from uh, someone who says they were psychologically and, and almost physically paralyzed by fear most of their life until uh, that that episode on the plane. Now, tell us about you're in that state of panic and what caused you to open that book and, and just to try and write something down. That seems like it took an awful lot of control at a moment that you were spiraling. 100%. You know, I think we all have ways of dealing with crisis. I've always wanted to be a writer. I've always written and journaled in my life. And to me, taking thoughts out of my brain and putting them on a piece of paper gives me a sense of control. Always? Always, always. I've always literally wanted to be a writer. I've always written thoughts. I obviously didn't share many of them publicly or verbally. Writing is a refuge, right? 100%, it certainly was for me. Yeah, I feel the same way about uh, writing. You know, when I'm dealing with a problem, I, I'm pen in hand, like I am chatting with you here, taking notes on what you're saying and ideas that you spur. I, I think it, it helps me to learn and pattern my brain and gives me that sense of I have a plan. I can do something about this. I have a list. I have a sequence. I know what to do. And it sounds like you started that journey on that flight with your Mead notebook and those seven words. The words became the mandate for that upcoming year. When I landed, I knew I wasn't going to turn around. Were you over your panic then? I was. How did that panic uh, uh, attack manifest itself? Heart beating, sweating, um, honestly feeling, feeling like I was going to die. You know, really in severe panic. I think all of the emotions of not being able to do, not being worthy enough, all hit me at this one moment on this flight. There was no one there to rescue me. There was no back room that I could go to in the record store and, 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 and collect my thoughts. It was just me and what I had committed to do. Was that the bottom, Scott? That was, was that a bottom. bottom for you. Yeah. I had, I had a lot of bottoms, Jim, but that, that to me was a moment where I thought, I can't do it. I can't handle it. Um, and the quote that I wrote those eight words gave me immediate relief. Um, it became almost like a, a self-directive because I landed. And then what I chose to do, because I had a plan and a mission, was every day for that entire year, I did one thing every day that pushed a comfort zone. Give us an example of what you do in the first week. Oh my gosh, it started so small. Um, say hello in Hebrew for the first time. Get on a bus the first time. Go to the post office for the first time. Introduce myself to somebody that I didn't know for the first time. Just tiny little actions that didn't feel so tiny in the moment, but looking back on them, they were. Did that mead notebook stay with you? I'm so glad you asked that question because this is so part and parcel of what I do now and, and what uh, the psychology and the, and the mindset around behavior design and dealing with courage is. I absolutely recorded every single one. 
not only did I do that in that Mead Spiral notebook, but I had to buy two others because I filled it up. So you were reprogramming your own brain. I was reprogramming and rewriting associations around pushing a comfort zone and leaping into the unknown without really knowing that I was doing it. I certainly hadn't yet studied about positive psychology or behavior design, but it just felt right in the moment. And I had given myself that mandate on the plane. And so over the course of the year, I think organically and without really knowing it, I stepped into something that I think is powerful and that everybody in the world could and should be doing. And that is creating a courage practice, not just a yoga practice or a meditation practice or a running practice, but a courage practice. And without knowing it, I used the consistency of the year away and that Mead spiral notebook and a pen, and I changed my entire life. Good for you. What a, what a wonderful story. And uh, your year comes to an end in Israel. Did you learn to speak Hebrew? I learned to speak some Hebrew. Um, the problem in Israel is that when most Israelis who are native speakers hear you starting to try to speak in Hebrew, they immediately <laughs> start speaking in English so that they don't have to take 10 minutes to understand what you're saying. But I did very much fall in love with that country and the people, and I mean people of all faiths. Um, it was an absolutely edifying experience for me in, in, in every way. You must be living in... Uh... Uh, a state of concern these days? You know, I deal with fear on a daily basis, and there is probably more fear, uncertainty uh, around the world, polarization right now than many of us have ever seen or experienced, at least in our lifetimes. And I am. I'm deeply, deeply uh, concerned and worried, both for personal friends, but also for the for the future. Um, and, and that plays very much into um, how we all deal together with courageous action, because I do think courageous action creates connections between people. Couldn't agree more. And I'm so happy to be hearing your story, although I can, I feel pain myself listening to you, your story of your pain. Uh, you can't help but empathize because we've all had similar experience. Maybe it didn't grip our youth like it did you or all of our life until that point. But we've all had moments of it and overcoming it is it's so consistent with what I've learned uh, in a book project uh, I did with a, a partner. His name is Dr. George Everly and learning how he, like you, learned to overcome a problem. And the problem for him was a severe anxiety disorder, uh, ADHD, and uh, he's severely dyslexic. And he learned in early adulthood while he was in uh, college, late college, and then into graduate school, had to rewire his own brain when he was finally diagnosed and find out he wasn't dumb and he wasn't uh, a, a behavior problem. He had real cognitive disabilities and he rewired his brain. And I think it gives hope to so many to hear George's story, to hear your story, Scott, about how you can change. And a lot of people can tell their stories and clearly yours is a wonderful story. But I think the parents listening and their uh, even grandparents have that that same feeling your parents had of helplessness when you were in trouble. And we're always looking at what can we do? How can we take this on? How can we do more for them? And it just reinforces for me the importance of parenting of parents, especially when the, you can have the good fortune of two parents. And, and I'm going to argue some grandparents around, too, because I think we play a valuable role in our grand, uh, grand uh, children's lives. But the I, to always be reinforcing that whatever your situation, you can change. So tell us about your journey now, Scott, where you come back uh, from your year in Israel, you have the Mead notebook and two other notebooks you had to buy to chronicle all the things you've done to change how you think about things, how you feel about things, and how in little tiny ways and not so tiny ways, you started to confront your fears which in which unbundled it from the shame and now you're back you land in good old usa a slightly but maybe not so slightly different person would say i was a com different person <laughs> i really i felt like my whole orientation in the world was flipped on its ear 
What did your, your siblings and parents, did they notice that you're a different person right away? Within, I remember going to lunch with my parents upon landing in the U.S., and my parents said to me afterwards, we don't even recognize how you are talking, um, how you're interacting. Had you changed physically? Was your continence different? I think that there was almost like, you know, when you see somebody who is comfortable in their own skin, that there's there's almost a, an aura or a glow around them. You can you can almost tactily feel their presence. And I think I want they're more attractive, aren't they? Oh, my gosh. The, it's magnetic. And uh, I, so I went from a kid who would avert my eyes from someone else if they were coming close to me to somebody who actively pursued talking, meeting, introducing myself, asking questions, being curious, all of those things that we don't realize sometimes are courageous behaviors, but they really are. But what was courageous that first year in Israel became routine in your second year back in the U.S. Indeed. You know, we have this, um, this, these concentric circles of growth. And, and for me, I had a really small central circle. Like I was comfortable with my own family. I had wonderful, four wonderful grandparents who for much of my young life were my closest friends. All the time they were feeling your pain too. I guarantee that's the case. And I would come home and tell my grandparents that I was eating lunch alone in the school cafeteria at a table by myself. And there was this wonderful teacher, a drama teacher in my high school, my early high school years, who created a fake study hall. She created a study hall for one person in her office at lunchtime, and that was for me. So I didn't have to suffer the indignity and the trauma of sitting alone by myself. What was her name? Miss Picard. And, and I have to tell you, Jim, she just passed away. Um, I saw her obituary and a number of, 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 of people had uh, emailed me and I went to her funeral and I spoke at her funeral and I told the story that I just told you. And there was not a dry eye in the house because there are so many people in our lives who support us in our moments of greatest uh, challenge. Did you ever get to tell her? I did. I did. I, I, I think one of the key benefits of leading the life that I lead now, not the life I led then, is I uh, gratitude is a huge part of my life. I think gratitude greases the wheels for a courageous life, that when we feel grateful that we are uh, supported by others, we're supported by um, either a faith or a sense of providence or a sense that we um, we are on this earth for a reason, it gives us the capacity then to reach out to other people and tell them how important they've been to us. And is your reason, Scott, that you uh, learned to overcome this debilitating state of mind? Is your reason now that you can take the lessons that you stumbled into a pattern to overcome, uh, to bring that message to other people so they can overcome their fears, their shame, however, however mighty or however minor. For me, that is absolutely the passion that allows me now to step into companies and on stages and with people in my everyday life. Um, I did do one thing which moved all of this forward very dramatically. Um, I had met a wonderful professor at Harvard named Tal Ben-Shahar, who at that point was teaching the largest class at Harvard, which was called the Science of Happiness, Positive Psychology. And I went back and got a certificate with him and was, was really um, trying to actualize all these courageous impulses that I had. What did it look like if I could do this in my community? I remember, I remember reading in, in your book called Scare Your Soul, Scott Simon, that you had a traumatic incident uh, as a kid with a choir. And I think we're coming around to overcoming it, or at least proving something to yourself. Tell us that story. When I mention this to groups, there are so many nodding heads in the audience. Yep, because so, many, <laughs> so many people have had this experience. So when I was 10 years old in fourth grade, I was at our holiday choir concert prep. And there was a substitute choir teacher who was 
teaching us these songs that we would then sing in front of all of our family and friends. Whether they liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been to many as a parent and, and uh, I know the, new, the nuances of them now. So um, what was the song? The song was 76 Trombones. And I was given a little solo part in, in the song by the, by the substitute choir teacher. And when the entire fourth grade began and came around to this solo line, I could not speak it. I could, it literally, my throat closed up. You know, that feeling when you're so overcome by shyness, uh, shock, emotion, fear. And in, instead of just continuing on, he stopped the entire grade and started all over again. Which, of course, made it easier. It certainly did. I mean, the second time was so much better than the first. Um, same thing happened, of course. And then, believe it or not, he, for the third time, stopped us again and, and did it the third time. And I can literally remember, Jim, I am standing on the lowest riser, because that's where I was standing, because I was the shortest boy, low, l lower right-hand corner, all the, all, every eye on me. I can feel the eyes of the entire fourth grade on me. I literally, I couldn't move. I'm sure my face was bright red and I stumbled again. Nothing came out. And this guy who was wearing, I remember it. It was a shirt that had these big palm trees on it. It was, it was, it, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. There are no palm trees in Cleveland, but I remember the palm trees and he stomped towards me. Here's like an authority figure who is so angry. And he said to me, clearly you can't sing, just mouth the words for the rest of the year. Okay, so now you're up at Harvard. You have this wonderful professor whose name again was? Tal Ben-Shahar. Who's teaching a class on happiness and you're in, on your way to earning a certificate in living a happy life. That's exactly right. The, the, it, he was teaching a, a, a certificate program called the Certificate in Positive Psychology. And I had, I had, I loved his class because it was so actionable. So actionable, was it? Let's see now. So what happens on, say, some Sunday morning? Okay. So I decided, you know what? The, this monkey had been on my shoulder for too long after 35 years. So I grabbed an acoustic guitar and I found the busiest restaurant in my town on a Sunday morning which is called the Inn on Coventry. If you go there on a Sunday morning, you will see a line out the door as everybody is waiting. And I sang in front of about 100 strangers that morning. No prep, no, <laughs> nothing but terror in my heart. Was your heart pounding? It was maybe the scare. The, I was probably more scared in that moment than I had maybe ever been my entire life. In that moment. I, and it was self-inflicted. Yes, but you, you went to the edge. I, I went to the biggest edge. I went to the top of the highest cliff and look over the side. And then I jumped off. And this class gave you the strength to say, this is one more brick in my road of becoming a better person. I, I, I couldn't lead a life of, of, of small acts of courage and leaving this one unturned. I had to do it. It was huge. And, and I'd go to concerts with friends and, and you know this, you're, you're at a concert venue and they're all singing at the top of their lungs. And in my forties, I'm mouthing it. So, uh, what happened? What did the crowd do? First, I think they were confused. Why is, does this guy who has a terrible singing voice and I do, the <laughs> choir teacher was not wrong. <laughs> Why is he doing this? And I would say it probably took about 30 seconds of sheer terror on my part and sheer confusion on theirs. But all of a sudden, it was like the crowd turned. They, a young kid brought a crumpled up dollar bill and threw it into my guitar case. And everyone laughed. And I started to enjoy this experience. And within about, as I said, 30 seconds or so, it became this joy bomb of an experience. Endorphins are released. I can, I can feel this. It was like a flood of freedom in my veins. Freedom. This, this shackle for 35 years was now uncoupled. And I had done it. No one forced me to do it. I did it on my own. It was my volition. 
And, and after it was over, everyone applauded and I put my guitar back in my case. And I remember leaving the restaurant and it was almost like I, I was levitating back to my car. And you had a dollar. And I had a dollar. <laughs> I could buy a quarter of a cup of coffee. If I just got a few more, if I got a few more dollars, I could have gotten a latte. I came home. What happened next was actually really important. I came home on this high and instead of keeping it to myself, which I could have done, I wrote a Facebook post about the experience because I thought others should see what one guy who grapples with fear every day did. And that's the icing on the cake. You, 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 you take this, you had this great range of emotions in 30 seconds unparalleled. And then all of a sudden you say, well, I did that. I'm going to take the next step now and go public with this experience, not just enjoy it myself, but I'm going to take another step in my path of overcoming fear and shame. And I'm going to go publicer. Publicer and in the most vulnerable way that I could to tell everybody I am a former bullied kid who is on a path, a journey, a struggle. And I did something today that I have to tell you about. And I wrote about this experience. Any reaction? There was a slight reaction. Um, it went viral. <laughs> um, the next You've been day, outed. <laughs> I, I outed myself. And the next day I had messages from literally around the world. I, I, I can't tell you how amazing it felt to hear from people around the world. Hi, I'm Jim McCann. And I'm George Everly Jr. During the COVID-19 epidemic, I stumbled upon an article that Dr. George wrote, which had a real strong impact on me in terms of how COVID was and was likely to impact our social connections, our relationships. And it really, really resonated with me. So I reached out to George, basically wrote him a fan letter, and that began our relationship. We found a mutual interest in helping people become their best selves, especially in times of adversity. Together, we embarked on a quest to co-write Lodestar. That journey began with countless hours of researching the most impactful self-help books out there. Once we had our picks, we combined the science with the practical. The result of our journey, the creation of a one-stop shop for the best of the best in self-help. We decided to write this book to help others go from where they are to where they want to be and be the best possible selves they could be. So if you're looking to boost your career, build stronger relationships, or simply become the best version of yourself, Lodestar is here to guide you on your path. Vulnerability is powerful. It sure is. And when you tap into something that other people are feeling and struggling with, and you tell them in a way you have a permission slip to do this too, it is so powerful. And that's what I experienced with those thousands of texts and emails and messages that I got that next day. And I literally created a website that night, um, a cheap, ugly website. Um, and the name that came to me in the moment was Scare Your Soul because it felt like I had just scared every part of my <laughs> whole soul that Not day. Not your being, it went to your soul. It did. And, uh, and literally that commenced the next phase of my life, which was not just leading my own courage experience and my own courage journey, but inviting people to join me on it. So describe how you, how you spend your, your life now. Yeah. Well, it's very different as of January 1st, because I, I had been CEO of a real estate company while I was doing all of this. And on January 1st, I quit my job and um, gifted my salary to every other employee in our company. And I now get to do the most amazing thing, which is to go to companies and organizations and, uh, and, and groups and talk about courage and talk about my story, talk a little bit about the science behind fear and courage. And I really uh, hope to engender courageous engagement in companies and in teams um, and in people. Go ahead. Give us a sense of you're working with a company and what do you do? Who are you working with? What do you do? And what have you seen happen? So I just gave a keynote to a group of real estate professionals, um, hard driven, um, very successful, 
real estate professionals. And I, I followed a number of industry experts who talked about their field and, and I stood up and I said, I want to tell you about a kid who, who's, who, who, uh, was on the lowest riser of a choir concert. And I told them my story. And all of a sudden I saw everybody in the room begin to soften. Um, their, um, their emotions started to come to the surface. Um, and I began to talk about what it means to lead a courageous life, <clears throat> what it means to connect courageously. Um, and, uh, when I speak, um, I talk in practical terms. I talk about what people can do that day, that week. Then, uh, I, I went into another workshop with a, with a, with one of those companies that was represented in that real estate group. Um, and I ran a 90 minute um, experience where they all connect with each other courageously. I use art and music and connect them in a way that they are totally out of their comfort zones, but they are connecting so deeply with each other that they walk away arm in arm. Wow. And so I get to really find my way into these wonderful companies and organizations and help them build cultures and build teams that are engaged and inspired. And I just, I think I've got the best job in the world. Now, when you wrote uh, Scare Your Soul, it's a couple of years ago now, do you think that there's a, 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 a follow-on or, or workbook? Because I think, listening to your story, Scott, reading about it before, that there are loads of parents and grandparents out there who want to help kids in their lives. I just met with my publisher about two weeks ago, Jim, and I, it sounds like you were in the room. Um, that is exactly what the next phase of Scare Your Soul will be, is focusing more specifically on different life transitions, different um, folks who need courage in their life, and that is teens, people starting a first job, people who are first-time par first parents, um, people who are longtime parents like me who are becoming empty nesters, people who are retiring, people who are going through grief. All of these uh, life transitions bring the need for courage along with them. And I think there is so much of an opportunity out there to band together, to share what works. Um, Scare Your Soul is as much of a community as it is people who read a book. Um, I invite people to uh, participate in our we free weekly challenges. Um, I have uh, an open offer for people to email me personally. I put my email address in my book, believe it or not, even though my publisher warned me not to. But that will be the next phase, will be almost like a chicken soup for the soul. Finding folks who need courage in their specific area of life and making sure they have the tools and the inspiration to be able to leap into those challenges with a full heart. I think you have two audiences here, right? The person themselves who, who you want to help, to whether they're uh, six or 60, to be a better version of themselves. And lots of times that's dealing with shame or, or dealing with the fears that cause that or that are adjacent to it. But then there's everyone else who knows, hey, there's someone else I wish I knew how to help. They're yes. in pain. And if they're in pain, I'm in pain. It could be a coworker. It could be a relative. It could be a child, a grandchild, a friend, or the, or the child of a friend uh, that you're close to. And you see them hurting. That shyness, that introversion, that feeling of being different, separate, unincluded, not included, separated. It's just painful and it's omnipresent. I have heard anecdotally from when I give a, a talk at a library or at a bookstore, about half of my sales of my book are for as gifts for other people. And, and I agree with you. I think that we all have people in our lives who need a little bit more courage. Either they're stuck or they're living in fear. Because we all do the things that we do, wrote, not wrote. We, we care. We want to do something to help someone out. And you say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if you did this? And and it just doesn't get you there. Give me some more tools. Scott, you have more tools you can share. A absolutely. A and I think that was my goal in writing this book was it is as much a workbook as it is uh, 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 stories and science. 
If you crack it open, you'll probably see lines for reflection, check boxes that when people do acts of courage, they can record it in the book. Um, I, I do think that this is not, um, this is not a short term process. Building muscle in our courageous lives is like running a marathon. We don't do it day one. Are you still on your journey? Every day. Are you still in recovery? I am still in recovery. I, I want to be in recovery. I, I don't ever want to forget the days when I didn't feel like I could walk out of my own house, that I, that I didn't feel like I, if I had an idea, I could raise my hand and, and, and speak my truth. I, I never want to forget those days because it gives me passion and empathy now. And that's so important to me. I, I never want to lose it. The bullying that I went through, I got through it. I survived. And, and, and it makes me who I am to this day. My struggles and my challenges make me who I am. And I know so many people that are listening may feel like their struggles and their challenges have defined them and they can't change. And the truth is we absolutely can. If we prioritize action, small action, celebrating those actions, having an accountability partner that can support us in those actions. These are things that each one of us can do today. And it literally is life changing. Scott, this is a, a month. You're, you're, you have two, two daughters yourself. Uh, uh, Halloween supposed to be about fear really isn't maybe, maybe for little kids, but uh, this is sort of like your holiday. Are there any uh, rituals that you've developed in your family that make this a special time for you? And, and how, how are you working with your kids to make sure they never get and they never go down the path that you had to walk down and live in? Well, first off, I think my most powerful parenting impact has been through role modeling, not giving advice. I, I, I think when my kids see me stepping into bigger and bigger opportunities, stages, things that scare me, things that tweak my imposter syndrome. That is the biggest lesson that I think I've given to my two kids. But, but you're not just living. You're telling them, no, I get nervous before I go on stage. I, oh, I absolutely do. And I think that that is so important. You're, we're so busy faking it that it, we fake it till we make it. And all of a sudden, we aren't afraid anymore. But you do share with your girls that, oh, no, this is, this is frightening. I do have to prepare for this. A hundred percent. And I always have from minute one. I, and when people stop me and they do, they, they see us on, they see me on social media and in our Instagram account. And they say to me, Oh my God, you're, you're living the dream. You're living the dream. You are, you're, 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 you're skating down this beautiful path. And there is some truth to the fact that I love what I'm doing, but every day to me is an opportunity to put myself into that feeling of fear. Susan Jeffers wrote a great book that has the best title I think I've ever read, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That, and I'm sure, Jim, you know this. People look to you as this icon, as this, as this person who is perched atop the mountain. And I'm sure if, I, if you and I talked longer, you could tell me the things that cause you fear, trepidation, concern, the things that oh, deep down there's inside. there's nothing, nothing, Scott. <laughs> I don't believe it for a second, Jim. And we all have that opportunity to grow. So I, I tell my kids constantly, I'm doing this and I am, I am uh, scared about it. Um, they both know that I have one ritual that keeps me sharp beyond sharp. And it is probably our number one, what I call scare your soul challenge. And it is so simple. It costs about $4. It's buying a cup of coffee for a stranger and then having a conversation with them as you're waiting for your coffee to come. It is to me almost the epitome of healthy anxiety. You are committing an act of service. You are connecting with somebody that you don't know and you're not sure what's going to happen. Um, and 99 times out of 100, and I can say that with confidence because I have probably helped thousands of people. Starbucks, I think, should offer me a special uh, 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 designation <laughs> because I have helped them sell thousands and thousands of cups of coffee because when we do this, we feel in service, we feel that healthy anxiety, and we feel that moment, that joy bubble after we're done, because somebody always says, you know what? 
Absolutely. And then you end up having this conversation with somebody. I know people, Jim, who have told me that they are now in business with people. They have partnered with people because of this experience, because they opened themselves up to the person who was standing behind them. So my book is is full of hundreds. I'm not hawking my book. I'm just saying it was so important no, for I'll me. I'll do that, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it was so important for me to for this to be practical and for people to say, I can start this afternoon and my kids know that whether it's Halloween or it's not Halloween, that that I am out there doing something every single day. I have an accountability partner that I text every single night. She texts me, we've been doing it for 10 years. Three things we're grateful for and one risk we took that day. If everybody in this world had an accountability partner and they texted them three gratitudes a night and one risk they took, I cannot tell you what I think this world would transform into. It sounds like a modern day pen pal. Listen, you're the king of uh, of early tech adoption. Nobody is better than you at using technology in a way that nobody else has. And I say that with huge respect. I believe I have figured this out. If you could find somebody that you could send five gratitude, excuse me, three gratitudes to and one risk it gets you thinking every day about things you're grateful for, which greases the wheels for that risk that you take every day, which is your courage practice. We have someone on the team here. Her name is Meredith. Uh, Meredith uh, was working with one of our board members. His name is Larry Zarin. And Larry suggested that the whole idea of pen pals is right up our alley in terms of uh, uh, our focus on relationships and helping people to have more and better relationships by introducing them to you and your your life story and your concepts is a living example of that. So we're, we're testing into that. And we've introduced the idea of pen pals. I realized, oh, my God, I had a pen pal. And she was important to me in my youth and, and development. And, uh, and I shared that story. And now people have been sharing their stories with us. I think there's a place where it intersects here where we might do something beneficial for our community together. So I'll, I'll follow up with you, but give it some thought. Tell us what, what your life is uh, going forward. What's this next year going to bring? What are you going to do? You had the meeting with the publisher. Obviously, I had a listening device in the room. What's next? <laughs> Honestly, for me, it is um, helping more people and more companies step into courage. I, I, I love the energy of a group. I love the energy of of inspiring others. So for me, it is more and greater opportunities to do so. Um, writing a book, Jim, which uh, my publisher actually, strangely enough, reached out to me. She found that very ugly website that I told you about and 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 really felt like there is, there is a need in this world to grapple with fear. And um, so I really do uh, hope and believe that that second book will be in the works. Um, and I honestly, I love traveling. So the more opportunities I have to visit more places and speak to more people about courage would be, would be right up my alley. So in addition to running out and buying a copy of Scare Your Soul by Scott Simon, how might companies, how might people get in touch with you? You mentioned social media and we hear so much about how it's a, a, a bad tool for so many. It's obviously turned positive for you. Uh, frankly, thank God there wasn't a lot of social media when you were in your painful days. It might have made it worse. But uh, but now you're using it for good. And that day when you went home and wrote that post about what you did at the uh, at the breakfast at the brunch place that Sunday morning, uh, you've made good use of it. So how do people get in touch with you now? And what are you doing in social media now? Sure. So the best way for people to get a hold of me, my website is scottsimon.us and uh, happily uh, would talk to, to anybody who wants to talk about courage and engagement. Um, our social media is Scare Your Soul on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we put out a weekly courage challenge. It is free. It will always be free. Anybody can receive it. And I, I would love to send you our courage challenges because they give you something actionable every single week that you can do. You can share it with friends, you can do it together, um, and it becomes a, a, a consistency. You're building that courage muscle every week. Thank you, Scott Simon. Qu quick last question. Uh, the Mead Notebook and the two other journal, uh, journals you had to buy in Israel, do you still have them? 
not only do I have them, they are some of my most prized possessions, and I go back to them often to remind myself what I had done back in those earliest days to give me extra fuel and, and extra power as I'm doing what I'm doing. They are they're heirlooms to me now. All right. Last thing is, I'm going to go out and do something daring myself. I'm going to wish you Shana Tova. That was beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Scott. Jim, thank you. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Find the perfect gift. And wow the people you love. Wow. Wow. This is amazing. Whether you want to say happy birthday. So cute. Or I love you. I love you too. Thinking of you. Wow. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Celebrate the people you love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard. And I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon.